So last week we did um, the Alephs, these special ordinals, these initial ordinals that represent the cardinalities and the cardinalities that they represent the Alephs. And these turned out to be exactly the cardinalities of, well, multiple sets. Last week had the Alephs. Um, we observed last week and the week before that well orderable sets are closed under some operations. They close them to some or no product, if you like, but two well orderable sets. Product of two well orderable sets, and also um, subsets and indeed basic domains of injective functions into a well orderable set, or we'll just say subsets and images. You have a surjective function out of a well orderable set, then it's co domain exhaustive. Images. But as I remarked, we can't prove from the axioms we have that if we have a well orderable set, our set is again well orderable set. And more generally, we also can't prove, obviously, just more general, if we have two well orderable sets that the function space exponent is also. That can't prove with the axioms we have. And our set of x, the well vulnerable, and potential y to the x are well vulnerable. Can't prove that until we can assume today's axiom, most famous axiom. We can't prove that without AC. So today we're going to look very thoroughly at the axiom of choice. It's so diffuse in mathematics that you will have seen a lot of the material before, quite a bit of it also in the first year course on logging technologies at the most of you. During this first year course um, a long time ago. However, there were various things that were um, would have been impossible to prove in the first year, even as an extra material in the notes, because various equivalences require the notion of ordinals, transpon introduction, transpon proof. So today we're going to um, go through statements that are equivalent to the axiom of choice, also look at some applications of the axiom of choice. Um, but I'm going to be pretty comprehensive in what I state as results. But for, in terms of what we prove today, I'm going to just focus on results that would have been in accept unavailable to you when you did the first year course. Some other results I'm going to be exercises for you to find yourself to remember that from the dim and distant past. So I'm going to give the Pretty standard set theoretic formulation of the axiom of choice. So it relies on the notion of a choice function. So let S be an S be a set of sets. So of course, the very notion of a set of sets is slightly oriented towards the, uh, the particular take on set theory and in this course. Because in a lot of people on set theory, every sentence is I need to say the only thing is the universe sentences here. You don't need to say something is a set of sense. Um, I actually find it clarifying to have a more of a structure because it's useful to know that we're thinking of S as a set 
sense. It's useful to know that that's the context of functions. Right. We give it a sense of sets, it choice function for this. One test is a function. F but takes non empty sets from the sense of sets S as some as arguments. So we'll remove the empty set in case that it's there. Of course, we could say a set of non empty sets to begin with, but then that makes a few other formulations a bit more off the So it's, it's um, better to allow it to be an arbitrary set of sets. And uh, the co domain of this function for you here, but this is called sets, that satisfies that every, every set x in the set of sets s. X is not equal to the empty set, and it is applicable to it. It's called the choice function because f of x, f applies to the set of x, it chooses an element of the set of x. And just to give you a little preview. The axiom of choice is going to stay to the, the formulation of it. The standard formulation is every set of sets choice function. But before we do that, let's see what else we can say about when a set of set has a choice function, even the absence of the axiom of choice. And there's the following nice little theorem, which is the following are equivalent. Uh, so the first one is this. Well, actually, it's not about when an arbitrary set of sets has a choice function, it's about when a power set has a choice function. A power set has a choice function. If and only a set of which is the power set is well ordered. And this, this result is a fundamental connection between well order ability and choice function. Choice function. Yeah, choice you can see from this, but already we can see that the excellent choice is every set of sets as a choice function, then it's made of the excellent choice by the next set as well. Now let's prove this. Um, so, one direction is really easy, which is Go from a well order on set X to choice function. So let's do that first. I don't know if I can but we'll do one in place two. So suppose let's use the strict version. So suppose. Less than is the well order on X. Then we need to define choice functions on the power set of X. But let's call this. And the choice function will have any non empty subset of Y, sorry, any non, non empty subset Y of X to a chosen element of the set Y. If y is non empty, if we want to well order, well, we know that well orders are characterized by every non empty subset that has a, has a minimum element. So we simply map y to the minimum element of the ordering. What? Well ordering is just a canonical way of finding an element of every non empty subset. And we don't. That really wasn't. The other direction is far more interesting. And um, I mean, in the other direction, we start off with the choice function and we need to construct a well, order. So 
I'm going to call the J. So suppose that G is a choice function C dot F on uh, some place. Um, now the idea is rather straightforward. We need to construct a well ordering, and we're going to do that by we're going to by transfinite recursion, construct a mapping from the ordinals into X. And the first element, well, we just simply apply our choice function to the whole of X, assuming it's not empty. Um, our second element, we remove the elements we, the element we've already chosen, we apply our choice function to the remaining elements. We just keep on doing that, and that gives us an obvious recipe for transfinite recursion. It's going to, in the end, define an embedding of an initial segment of the ordinals into, into and onto the set X. And because you can only, because you can't embed the whole of the ordinals in the set X, so just like the construction we did um, last week or the week before, eventually we're going to run out of space. So at that point, we need somewhere else to assign the ordinals. So we're going to put a, another element into the code domain of the mapping from the ordinals at the end of the element, which is where we're going to map to anything once we've already sorted in the X. So, so, choose, so, let, so let E be an element in the universe. It's got to be X. And we define function by transfinite recursion. So I'm going to call this function y with an index where the index is going to be the ordinal that we map to the element. That's going to go from the ordinals to x. End element. Um, so by transfinite recursion. And it's very similar to what we did when we proved the representation theorem of the well so that every so every well order is um, every every well order is isomorphic to so by transfer of recursion, basically very similar construction. Why map an ordinal alpha to to satisfy the recursion equation. Um, so the more the lead one is that uh, we apply our choice function G to the remaining elements of X that we haven't already used up on small number. So we subtract from X all the Y and Ps for small number. And we do that, once again, as before, and just basically the same idea as with the uh, proof of the classification theorem of well orders. So we do that in the case that all the smaller ordinals are sent to elements of X, and moreover, they don't get exhausted to all the X. So in other words, if that set is a strict subset of X, if that's not the case, then we go to the Function error element, not, not error element and elements. Error element. Right. Well, you can think of it. The letter E seems suitable for all possible interpretations. You can also think of it as, as an exception to the programming by which I did Um. Okay. And once we've so, transfinite recursion in the form that I identified it when we, in, in exactly the form that we used when we proved the classification theorem of the whole transfinite recursion, exactly that form gives us such a function. And basically, exactly as in that argument, we established pretty much the same properties. So then, by, so, so once again, there's a statement that there's a chain of properties that you establish. Each one is quite straightforward. 
And I'm not going to do, I'm just going to keep you the statements in order. You can think about how to do them for yourself. I haven't even put them in the notes this time, but you can, if you're a little bit stuck, you can look back to the to two lectures ago, where we did the classification here. Uh, all this is very similar to that. So one proves that sets of all alpha, such that y alpha lands in X, is an initial segment of the ordinals. Prove these in your head as I go along because I that's, that one's an easy one. Second one's the only one for any, uh, any work, which is we prove that in this case the embedding is injected. So we don't have an a priori order on the set of X, we have to establish one. That's the difference with the classification theorem. The classification theorem is started with an order, and in this case, we, we derive up the top. Still so through injectivity. So y alpha is y beta, and alpha is beta. So that's the next property you establish. Once you've got that, you get the property that we can't embed all the ordinals in X. So therefore, we must we must arrive at E at some point. So we've got a proper initial segment of the ordinals. And by our results of that proper initial segment of the ordinals, that means that if we look at the alpha such that y of alpha and those ordinals then, which y of the ordinal lands in x, this is the proper initial segment of the ordinals, and hence of the form stripped down the set of gamma, some ordinal gamma. From gamma which is and finally, once we prove that, then it's easy to show that the um, that the set of all these y alphas is the whole of that position. Oh, this is the main function. Oh, nice. Those four properties together mean that we have a bijection from this set to X. So then, therefore, this map goes from the ordinals below gamma x is a bijection. The ordinals below gamma are well ordered. We have a bijection to a set, so we just transport the well order along with the bijection. We get to well order equal x. Hence, hence, we transfer well ordering. Okay, so that's that. The only good thing about having a tuned out camera is well, it doesn't need to move the camera. That's, that's, what, that's what moves between ports, which is always been always made fast. Um, okay, so now we can. So we've got two ways of looking at this well orderable sets and sets of sets with. Choice functions. Um, let's think about which sets have choice functions. So again, the sort of material that is preliminary to this course really and might have be been done in earlier courses. Taken, but if not, it's still the sort of thing you can think about yourself. It's the following uh, proposition, just right before, which is that every finite set of sets has a voice function. But the question of the existence of choice functions only becomes a question, really, when you have an infinite set. And this, so as I say, you don't know this immediately, think, go and try and prove it. You prove it by induction of the cardinality of the five of sets, but then it's a relatively straightforward argument. It's an instructive argument because it's instructive in the sense that 
you can then think about how does this argument break down? How does this reason break down when I have an agent set of steps? Why can't I just prove um, that every set of steps is an agent set? So we can't prove that every set of steps is a choice of action. Um, we can prove can prove D of X has a choice function where X is well eligible, as we've seen. I'm not sure why I've got this in the notes and it's, it's, it just had this result when X is eligible. But what can't be proved there is the limit of our knowledge. Um, so what we cannot prove It's simply the example of a power set, or a simple example of a power set. We can't, we don't know how to prove this as a choice without the choice. It's the power set of the means. Power sets of the natural numbers. We can, which is of course, construct a choice function is the natural numbers of the Power sets of the means cannot prove. We can't prove that the real numbers are well. Set are is well. So if you want to kind of focus on what the axiom of choice gives us that we don't have before, well, this is a good place. <laughs> and um, we already met dependent choice in this course earlier. We're going to look at a little bit more of dependent choice later today. These facts remain unprovable even if you have dependent choice. So, even if we have dependent choice. So, if you want to have a choice function on the power set of reals, or you want to have a well, or equivalently, if you want to have a well ordering on paths, you're going to need a more battle principle as an axiom. And um, that's going to be the answer for visuals. Is there a problem? No, no, I, uh, I just think it's exactly like that for this uh, uh, organization. Uh -huh. uh, it's the organization where you play it. Oh, panel there, panel there, panel there. No, but, but I thought it's a bit interesting. I in the Western society, left to right up the bottom. Um, I was just confused by the statement of the theorem, which just proves that again here. Aha, uh -huh. right. Okay. Yeah, it was a bit pointless to repeat it. So, anyway, so with this background in place, we can now state the extra choice. I've already stated it, but I haven't mentioned it yet. That's of choice. AC. Um, it's a good name, the axiom of choice. If you talk about something being of choice, like the holiday destination of choice or something like that, it's like the thing you would particularly choose to give you to be like it. But this obviously the axiom of choice is descriptive for what, for what AC is, but then the very name itself makes it is you know, perhaps. Makes it sound completely more attractive than it should. So, every set of sets is a choice. Of the and we're going to immediately go to the main theorem about the equivalence of the axiom of choice. Because, as you will know probably from your mathematical experience, the axiom of choice has. Many equivalents that crop up in mathematics. And um, we're going to have today's lecture, I think, including the statement of the axiom of choice itself, we're going to have seven main equivalents of the axiom of choice that are that are set theoretically. 
axioms. We're also going to have some mathematical statements. Statements from mathematical subjects. Um, the seven main statements, set theoretic statements to the group that's the Asimov choice, I'm going to divide, divide into two groups. First group we're going to do now is like the, the ones where the proof is um, kind of interesting. And the second group is statements that are quite easily shown to be the mentally excellent choice. And I'm going to leave the proofs of those as exercises, or maybe, maybe that's the sort of thing you might have seen in the class. And the main theorem is the one that is the excellent choice. The following, again, the following are equivalent. So the first one is the excellent choice. Second one, and actually, when I say one well, that's interesting to prove, we've already done the proof of the one is equivalent to two. So the, the second statement here is what's called the well ordering principle. Which is every set is well ordered. Then this is already clear by, by what we what we've already written. These two are the third one is a mathematician's favorite version of the axiom of choice, Zorn's land. Zorn's land states, as hopefully many of you know, must Mentioned before. Um, if every J in a particle of insert has an upper bounds, then Watch me. I think you can to check that the microphone is really Anyway, hopefully, there's a microphone. Otherwise, there might be an alternative homework, which is to add some type of video. I think there are a few concepts you might need to remember the definition of, but we've studied that before. So, and we've already had a coder on many of the theoretical concepts in the previous lecture notes. So just to say, all the concepts here are defined again in the lecture notes of this lecture. I shall just do the proof. And as we need property of a concept, I'll mention it. So I'm not going to spend time writing down the definitions here. Um, so we're going to prove this theorem, but as I said, we, we've, made, we've already proved one is equivalent to two. So we're not going to bother with that. So we're going to prove that the easiest one is to prove that one is equivalent to three. So we're going to prove one implies three and three implies one. Let's see what order you the the notes. Right, they're both about equal lengths. Um, let's do one implies three. So let's find we've got a partial order, so an X together with the rest of the equals. Um, the, the partial order 
in which every chain has a step has a lots of step around has a map of that. And um, we've assumed PC, so we're going to assume that we've got a choice function for the power set of X. So that's we're not assuming that the axiom of choice gives us that we have a choice function for the power set of X. So that G be a choice function. And we want to find a maximal element of the partial order. So remember, a maximal element is an element in the partial order for which there's no other element strictly above it. So we can be a maximum element. Maximum element would be one that's above every other element. But here we just need an element that there's no other element above it. And the idea is really easy because, I mean, we've got the partial order. I mean, it doesn't need to know about that unless it's some, some sort of floppy thing where you're, where you're ordering uh, this is less than equals in this direction. Um, we've got a choice function. So we're going to, again, map the ordinals into the partial order. So we're going to map zero. Can, can, so let's call this, let me see, I'm using Y again. Um, so we're going to have y of zero is going to be chosen by applying g to the whole partial order. Once we've got y of zero, we're going to apply g to all the elements above, strictly above y of zero, and that will give us y one. And we, and we keep on going like that, and we're going up by construction. And um, then you know, if you've still got elements left after we put all the natural numbers in, well, then we've got a chain, and then that means there is a set of bounds because every chain, so a chain is a linear, a linear border within the question border. So we have an upper bound, so we apply G to the set of all upper bounds, and that's going to give us Y sub omega that's above everything we've got so far. We keep on going Y omega plus one, so on. We just keep on going heading up all the time until. We run out of you know, until there's nothing above us in the partial order. Eventually, we, we're betting the ordinals are in class, so eventually we're going to have to break out from the top of that. And uh, the point that we break out from the top of that is just our maximal elements. If it hadn't been maximal, we could have, at the point that we were at, we would have got something beyond it. Okay, so that's kind right, of the construction. So again, we're going to use, so you, you know, crucially need most fine application to do this. Um, so once again, um, let B be an element of the universe in X, and we're going to define another family indexed by ordinals. Um, so this is map ordinals to X and E. And this time we've got permission this by alpha. So this is again by transpired application. That's not one that's right now. So this time to get y from alpha, so we apply g our choice function to the set of all elements in the partial order that are we want something that's beyond what we've already got, that's above what we've already got, and um, we're going to prove that it works. We're going to prove that uh, this is. This chain, but to get something beyond what we've got, we want an upper bound to what we've had so far, but not just an upper bound, a strict upper bound. So, a strict upper bound is an upper bound that does not belong to the set you're taking an upper bound of. So, we're going to ask, we're going to take G of the set of all strict upper bounds of the elements we've reached so far. So, X is a strict upper bound. Of 
that all the elements that we got from lower vortices. You know, closing the brackets with that. Oh, sorry, there's a G. So this is G lines to the set. That's the set brackets here. And it's application. So this makes sense is if this set is non empty. So, and if this set is non empty, that's the same thing as if such a strict up bound exists. So this is if such. A strict bound exists. And if no strict up bound exists for this set, either because perhaps we weren't applying it to a chain, although when we get to the proof, it will turn out that we are always applying it to the chain, but we don't know that at the point that we make that decision. Or the strict up bound might not exist because they've already, they've already reached the point. In that case, we give ourselves the exception. And um, we now, you know, very similar to what we've seen before. So we now establish the relevant properties. So we observe that. So in this case, the relevant properties are. Um, First one is in got the ordinal beats are less than alpha and y and uh, y of alpha is in x, then and y beta is also in x. Okay, so again, again the set of ordinals that are sent to an element of x are an initial segment, but moreover. Which is also giving us injectivity in this case. Um, for that, we also have the excuse me, also y beta is strictly less than y power. And that's this is all basically immediate from this definition as given. So we're asking for a string. Okay, so injectivity is actually easier in this case than it was in the previous case. Previous argument by Jonas Mike. I believe. Um, so that we show there exists some ordinal alpha um, such that I is the exception, of which is always going to be the exception. And the reason for that is again we can't invent the whole field x. So this field is of the class. So at some point we have to leave the set x because we were we're inventing it by, by this first property. Because there exists some alpha, there is at least such an alpha. So let gamma be the least order of all. Let gamma be always such a bad. Then by this first property here, we have that by beta of all beta less than gamma is a chain in so this this is the smallest ordinal that's not that doesn't belong. Which y of the ordinal does not belong to x, but all the elements belong to x. By this first property here, they they are um, its chain. So this is a, a chain x, and therefore by our assumption that every chain has an upper bound, it has some of that. Um, so it has. Why? I don't think we need the picture anymore. 
So we've got all eta less than gamma. This is another bound. The y beta is less than equal to one. That's just simply stating what it means to be an upper bound. It can't be a strict upper bound because if it were a strict upper bound, y of gamma would have been defined to select one of the strict upper bounds. Okay? In which case it wouldn't be e. But we have no y of gamma. We have no y of gamma is e. So y cannot be a strict upper bound. And if y is not strict of the bound, then y is equal by alpha or some some alpha. But this alpha then has to be the, ma the maximal element in the set of betas such that y beta belongs to the pairs. And y has to be the maximum has to be a maximal element of the set because otherwise, if it weren't, again, why if it weren't, then there would be a strict upper bound, and so G applied to gamma. So, uh, Y gamma, which is G applied to the set of strict upper bounds, would have, would have not returned. Um, I think this, this is actually a bit irrelevant, but it's, it's a strict upper bound. Um, why, why, why cannot be a strict of the bounds? Let's put it here. Yeah. Well, I've got to set that this means that's why it's the next part of the statement. I've given the reasoning, so, so I already. I already, I already gave the argument there, but um, somehow I've lost the thread of it now in my, my own mind's eye, which means it's time to look at the huge plot on the back wall and see that it's already streaming, already been to the screen at the moment, which is a bit hard. But anyway, so it's three minutes past three, so it's a good time to have a break. Um, so we'll have a break until 18 minutes past three. Pause the video. And well, so we were in mid proof, but we um, we were looking at the. And remember that if you're sitting under a microphone, everything you say may be recorded. So just 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 be careful. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we've done one is equivalent to two, and we've done one implies three. So the remaining thing to do implication to do is three implies one. So how does the axiom of choice follow from Zorn's lemma? Um, I'm not going to do that many details of this. There's a, there are a few details to verify. I just want to give the outline of it because it's basically a typical example of an application of Zorn's lemma, how you do this. Um, and you've probably seen other applications of Zorn's lemma in your life. Um, so in this case, we want to prove the axiom of choice. So suppose that S is a, suppose S is a set of sets, um, but it's, it's very easy to see that it's sufficient to consider non-empty sets. So this makes life a little bit easier. So suppose it's a set of non-empty sets. And we need to find a choice function for, for S. And we need to. And we can do that using Zorn's lemma. And it's pretty obvious that to find such a choice function, we need to set things up so that we've got a partial order and the maximal element of that, well, a maximal element of that partial order is a choice function. Um, so a choice function is a function whose domain is the set S of sets. 
Um, how can we have a partial order of things related to that? Well, it's natural to just consider partial approximations to choice functions as a, par as a partially ordered set where we consider one partial approximation as below another if it is, well, if the restriction of the second function to the domain of the first function gives us the first function. So we can set that up very easily. Um, we define F, which is going to be a set of partial choice functions. And that's easy to state because it's F. So it's the set of all functions F such that F is actually a choice function on the subset S prime of S. So it's a choice function that assigns chosen elements to some of the subset, some of the sets in the set S. And F is partially ordered in a very natural way that F is one, F is below, a little F is below a little G, where they're both choice functions on subsets. If the domain of the little F is a subset of the domain of little G, and the functions f and g agree on the domain of little f. But an easier way of saying that is if we just represent functions as their graphs, and we can simply say that the graph of the function little f is contained in the graph of the function little g. So we know how to represent functions by graphs. Let's just assume functions are represented by graphs, and we can simply say this is partially ordered by the subset relation. Um, So then, this is obviously a partially ordered set. It's very easy to show that every chain has an upper bound. In fact, it has a least upper bound. And the upper bound is simply what set theoretic operation gives us the upper bound? Sorry? The union. The union. Yeah. If you have a, a chain in subset, then in the subset ordering, then the union is again going to be a choice function. Um, so every every partially ordered set has an upper bound and the least upper bound. The partial order has a maximal element, and it's very easy to show that the maximal element is um, is a choice function on the whole of S. Because if it weren't, we could extend it, um, and it wouldn't be a maximal element. So, so I'm going to omit all the further details. They're in the notes just to give you the idea of, of how it works. And I think, I believe you've met applications of Zorn's lemma before. So, so, so any maximal element of F, any maximal element of F, F is partial order of functions, is a choice function. S and by three, namely Thorne's lemma, such a maximal element exists. Okay, good. So that's the equivalence of these three statements, the axiom of choice, the well-ordering principle, and the And the uh, and Zorn's lemma. So that's our first theorem of equivalences. So that one I've not given fully detailed proofs, but I've given you ideas of the proofs. The second theorem of equivalence is to the axiom of choice, which could have well just been together with the first, but um, these are statements that are quite close to the formulation of the axiom of choice. And one simply proves directly that they're equivalent to AC under its ordinary formulation. But the other equivalents to AC that we're going to, to look at today, or mention, I'm just going to mention them and then we'll move on to something else, is, is the theorem that uh, each of the following is equivalent to 
is equivalent to AC. And probably all of you have heard, or most of you have heard of most of these. There are only going to be three statements. Um, so the first one is a Cartesian product of a set index, I won't write that down, set index family of non-empty sets is itself non-empty. So got a family of non-empty sets, put them together and you get a non-empty set back. It's very intuitive and this, you know, this almost makes me believe the axiom of choice is true, this statement here. Um, but uh, anyway, we might discuss that um, either later today or, or on another occasion. Um, the second equivalent is every surjection, so every subjective function has what's called a section. So a section is a right inverse. So if you've got a, a map R X to Y, then a section is a map S from Y to X, such that R composed with S is the identity on uh, Y. The, the definition's in the notes. And, and this is one that category theoretic people that know some category theory will be familiar with because this is saying in the category of sets, every epimorphism is a retraction in category theoretic terminology. And the other statement that I want to put in this theorem is that um, every equivalence relation has a set of representatives for equivalence classes. If you've got an equivalence relation, it partitions a set into a number of disjoint equivalence classes, and a set of representatives is a subset of the starting set that contains exactly one element from each equivalence class. The full definitions are in the notes, but I, I don't want to go into more, more details in the lecture today. I just want to flag these as equivalent statements, many of which many of you will already be familiar with. And just to say that, well, I've already said, basically these are all, there is the proofs we had here all involved a bit of transfinite recursion to, to, to get them to work. Um, so they, they needed the ordinals. These proofs all work at a much more elementary level. So these proofs, basically, you just, you don't need the ordinals, but you just work with the axiom of choice itself. And all of them are pretty much about picking out elements from non empty sets. So, for example, the, when you've got an epimorph, they have got a surjection here. It, every element of the codomain little y has a non-empty fiber up here. And what our section needs to do is pick out for every element of y, pick out an element from the fiber that gets mapped to that element little y. So it's choosing represent is choosing elements out of non-empty sets. The same with finding representatives for equivalence relations, equivalence classes and non-empty sets, and for every equivalence class you need to pick a particular element. Right, good. So those are equivalents of the axiom of choice, and that is, I said there were going to be seven, I've actually, I was miscounting because there are only, I've got six so far, That's, those are all the equivalents we're going to do in today's lecture. We get one more equivalent next week at the start of the, right at the start of the lecture. Um, and we'll get some more mathematical equivalents a bit later on today. So the axiom of choice is very useful in mathematics. 
So it's often used, and we're going to I'm going to, we're going to look a little bit later at mathematical consequences. Um, but it also has some strange consequences. I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that later. And because of that, it's useful to identify weaker versions of the axiom of choice, which have some of the good consequences, but not some, but not the strange consequences, if you like. So we're going to spend a little bit of time now looking at weaker versions of the axiom of choice, where you have some choice implicit in, in an axiom, but not the full power of the axiom of choice. So weaker notions of choice. Well, we've already met one, and that's dependent choice, which I'm not going to write out again. Although I'll mention what it is when we come to prove something about it in a moment. So we'll again sort of see, see the definition uh, as we use it. Um, but we had this, I think it was way back in lecture two, because we used this to prove at that stage that um, not every that, that, uh, that every infinite set is Dedekin infinite. And then we used it again in a later lecture to prove that we have this characterization of well-foundedness in terms of the non-existence of um, descending chains. So we've used that at least twice already in the course. But there's a weaker version of choice that's kind of often useful, us usable in place of dependent choice. I'm going to call that CC, so that's countable choice. So for some reason, whereas DC is, a stat is a, an accepted acronym for the dependent choice, so it's used throughout the, the theoretic and mathematical literature, AC is of course very well known as an acronym for the axiom of choice. Um, it doesn't seem to be a, an accepted acronym for accountable choice, but it seems it seems natural to have a to, to call it CC. So why not? Um, and now we're missing only a BC because we've got an AC and a CC and a DC. Well, maybe we're missing a, a chut up as well. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you can so if you want to invent a BC and a chut up, then it would be nice to have some other principles. Anyway, countable choice is very easy to, to state. So CC simply states every countable set of sets has a choice function. And the next theorem is going to do the relationship between our three choice principles that we have. So it's absolutely obvious that AC implies CC, because it's just a special case. However, it becomes a bit less obvious when we put the more refined version in, which is that dependent choice interpolates that implication. So the axiom of choice implies, in, 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 in voice, implies the axiom of choice implies dependent choice and dependent choice implies countable choice. So this is, these are general implications that are valid. So countable choice is, a, is the weakest of these choice notions. Um, and we'll have a look soon, a little bit about its scope. Um, and just as a remark, don't have, in this course, the uh, technology to show this, but neither of the converse implications holds. So if we assume countable choice, we can't prove dependent choice. If we assume dependent choice, we can't prove the axiom of choice. So neither, neither of the converse implications holds. Neither of the converse holds.
Okay, so I want to take a little bit of time to prove that dependent choice follows from the axiom of choice and that countable choice follows from dependent choice. And let me just, I mean, just going on a bit without looking at my notes. So let me just check that um, I haven't actually gone off script. Yeah, apparently not. Good. Um, right. So actually, in proving that the axiom of choice implies dependent choice, at this point, we really do need to remember what dependent choice is, but we're going to remember it on the fly. So we're going to we're going to prove that AC implies DC. So to prove dependent choice, we suppose we've got a set X. So let X be a set. So dependent choice says if you've got a set and we have a binary relation on the set that has this totality property that from any element little x of the set x, we can find a little y from the set y that is that is related in the relation to y. So let so let R be a relation on x satisfying totality property for all little x in x. There exists a little y in x such that x is in the relation with y. Then we want to prove that for any starting element little z, we have a sequence in the set x, x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, an infinite sequence that starts at z, and such that each successive, each element is related to the element that comes after it. So we need to prove we need so the axiom of dependent choice tells us we need to find so we need to find um, so or rather given the starting element z in x we need to find a function let me look in my notes to see what we're calling it um, so I'm calling it x sub a number, so it's a sequence from numbers to, so it's an infinite sequence, um, satisfying that x0 is z, and for all n, x of n is in the relation with x n plus 1. That's what we need to find. And basically, we're going to do this just using the recursion theorem. And we can use the recursion theorem as long as we have a way of, if you've got an element n, so you've got an element x of n, finding the next element that will come after it. And we can do that using a choice function. We simply use, so let's, So let G be a choice function on the power set of X. On power set of X. And, um, and we define the function from the natural numbers to X, just using the recursion theorem. which tells us that to define a sequence, we need to specify what x0 is, which is z, and we need to specify a rule which will take us from any x sub n to x sub n plus 1. And that rule in this case is x n plus 1 is simply g applied. We need to find some 
successor, successor element according to the R relation to X sub N. So we simply apply a bitotality that exists such an element. So we simply apply G to the non-empty set of all little y in, in the set X, such that X N is in the relation R with little y, which by totality is non-empty. And, um, and we're done. It's obvious that this has the, re this has the required properties. Um, there are two curious things about it. One is that you know, if you're doing informal mathematics, you, you almost don't see the need for this G here. Because if you're doing, if you were writing informal mathematics, you have this property that exists for, for every X, there exists a Y. You would quite often write, let XN plus one be some Y such that XN is in the relation with, with Y. And you think that defines a function. But it doesn't define a function. It does define a function if you have the axiom of dependent choice, because the axiom of dependent choice tells you exactly that that defines a function. We don't have the axiom of dependent choice. We're trying to prove the axiom of dependent choice. But the axiom of choice gives us the way of a way of circumventing the problem because we don't need to say some little y. We actually have a canonical way of finding such a successor element because we apply our choice function that the axiom of choice gives us to the set. So that's the first remark. The second remark is it sort of often feels when you first meet these axioms that dependent choice should follow from the axiom of countable choice. I've already told you that it doesn't because neither of the converses hold. You can see that the proof is absolutely not using countable choice here because X could be a rather large set. And in which case we're doing a choice function on, we're using a choice function on the power set of X. That's very, well, I mean, as soon as X is infinite, we're doing a, um, for any infinite set, we're using a choice function not on the countable set here, because the power set of an, an infinite set is never countable. Um, so we're absolutely not using the axiom of countable choice here, and one can't get away with the axiom of countable choice. Okay, so that's AC implies DC. Um, So from dependent choice to countable choice, this, uh, this is actually quite easy, but it's a, a bit nasty to write out if you write it out using the ordinary formulation of countable choice. So I prefer to do it is rather, rather than proving countable choice in the way we formulated it, any countable set of sets has a choice function. Um, we prove the following equivalent to the countable choice. It's an equivalent statement. I'll just write equivalent to countable choice. And that's the countable version of the statement that a product of non-empty sets is non-empty. So, so the, the statement we're going to have is for any any n indexed family of non empty sets. Non empty sets. The product of all that, of all the countably many non empty sets. Is again non empty. And just as it was an exercise to prove that the axiom of choice is equivalent to the statement that an arbitrary product of non empty sets is non empty, it's an exercise to prove that countable choice is equivalent to this statement. And basically, the same proof does both jobs. So, uh, so anyway, we'll just take it. We're given that that's an equivalent statement. And now it's really easy to prove countable choice from, in this form, from dependent choice. Because
Whereas suppose we want to prove this statement. So suppose we've got a countable family. Um, so this is a family of non-empty sets. And we want to show that there exists an element in the product that there exists a sequence of, of elements where the ith element in the sequence is in the set X, well, the i indexed element in the sequence is in the set X sub i. Okay. So we need to prove there exists a sequence. Union of n over n x n such that every every x i belongs to every element little x i in the sequence belongs to the set capital x i. So this is for all i in n. Okay, and we're going to do that using dependent choice, where we need a set with a relation on it, and and we reduce this to the dependent choice on the set, or we simply consider the sum, the sum set of, of all the of all the x sub n. So remember this, this is equal to the set. Oh, that's not a good set. This is equal to the, the set of. I just realized the board light's not on. Um, that might improve the video. So many different layers of technology to deal with. So you know, even electric lights are one layer of technology. Um, so this is the set of pairs, as you remember, little n in X, where n is a natural number. And x, little x belongs to the n indexed n index set. So that's that's the sum set. So we consider this set together with the relation on it that x little n is related to x prime little n prime. Oh, sorry, I've got to put them swapping my, the order of my things. So so an element little n a tagged element x in set. X of n is going to be related to a tagged element x prime in set little n prime if and only if simply n prime is n plus one. So the only dependency we're forcing is we're starting with we're putting a relation in which um, from an element in Every element of the set X sub n is related to every element of the set X sub n plus one. And then starting with any any zero X where X belongs to set X zero, dependent choice will give us a sequence of elements in the sum that if we remove the, uh, if we, we can consider only the second component, consider only the element of little x, gives us the resulting sequence. So dependent choice gives us a sequence of pairs whose first components provide the required sequence x, the required sequence that we were looking for. Um, well, the required elements of the product would have been a quick way of writing things earlier. Okay. All right. So we've, we've seen the axiom of choice. We've seen long ago dependent choice, but we've seen it again now. We've seen countable choice. We've got these three implications between them. 
Now what we're going to do is kind of start at the bottom end and see what, what these axioms are good for. Starting with countable choice and then strengthening the, the axioms as we need them until we get to some theorems that we... So we're now going to look at mathematical theorems until we get to, to some theorems that we really need to be... Um, really need the full axiom of choice for. So before doing that, are, are there any questions on anything so far? Um, okay, so... Uh, A mathematical, but I'm, I'm not going to spend very long on countable choice and dependent choice. Um, so that we want to get on to maximum choices and full AC as soon as possible. The so mathematical consequences of CC. Well, actually, these ones are not very math. The first one's not very mathematical. The first one we've already seen, which is that every infinite set is Dedekind infinite. We don't have the tricky distinction between two different notions of infinite set, but it's worth mentioning here because when we did this in lecture two, I used dependent choice to prove it, but it is, as I mentioned at the time, a consequence of countable choice. Now we know what countable choice is, you are invited to find the proof using countable choice. Okay, it's a little bit trickier than the proof using dependent choice, but it's not very hard. Um, and the second one is a very famous result that's used all the time in mathematics without second thought. And you could, you know, a lot of mathematics gets quite tricky if you don't have this. So set theory without countable choice uh, really becomes a bit hard to deal with, especially if it's constructive. Um, as some people who've been to recent seminars would, would know. Um, but anyway, even classical set theory with countable choice is quite hard, without countable choice is quite hard to deal with. So without countable choice, you don't have the following, which is that every um, a countable union of countable sets is countable. This is a very famous fact. Countable union of countable sets. And if you're surprised that you need some choice for this, so I'm not going to dwell on it because it's kind of basically, again, something that's material before this, prior to this course in some sense. But if you're surprised at this, I invite you to think about this. And if you're stuck with it, please ask me. But it's, um, you know, it's good to prove for yourself that a countable union of countable sets is countable and see where you need countable choice and do it using only countable choice, not dependent choice. So that's consequence of, of, um, of those are consequences of countable choice. We have consequences. Oh, by the way, I mean, it's such a, con if you don't have countable choice, even we've got classical logic here, there's a famous paper in set theory that constructs a model of set theory without countable choice in which the reals are a countable union the real numbers are a countable union of countable sets so that's classical classical set theory without choice so um, and as some of you who've been to seminars recently or watched announcements may know and now from professor bauer it's known that in constructive set theory if you don't have countable choice the reals can even be a countable set which is very surprising Anyway, we're in the classical world here, and uh, you know, I never want to consider life without countable choice, except for amusement purposes. Um, so consequences of dependent choice, I'm only going to mention the one we've already seen, which is that it's a characterization of well-foundedness that there is no decreasing, infinite decreasing sequence. So well-foundedness,
and the, the interest, the implication that requires dependent choices. This one is implied by there is no decrease of infinite decrease in sequence. Okay. So those are consequences of dependent choice. And then we get to the very interesting question of why is the axiom of choice? It's a bit controversial in mathematics, you know, it took took there was a lot of when it was it was first used implicitly without people realizing they were using it at the start of the 20th century. It was then identified and then it, you, and then it turned out to have some awkward consequences and then it became, it became quite controversial. And anyway, it was a big story, to, a long story to be told, but why have mathematicians become so fond of, why is, depend, why is the axiom of choice their axiom of choice? Um, and, The reason is it has so many consequences. So we're going to look after the break at consequences, really mathematical ones, of the axiom <laughs> of choice. But now it's uh, exactly four o'clock, five o'clock on the back wall. So we'll break until quarter past and we will start again. Okay, so in, in this last part, I want to remind you, probably to the most extent of some of the well-known mathematical consequences of the axiom of choice, and then talk about some of um, some of the we'll start with the, the pleasant consequences, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, the less pleasant consequences. Um, so there are so many important mathematical consequences of choice that you know, one doesn't quite know where to start. And this is just a, a reasonably random list, but it includes some of the theorems that everyone would put on this list. So you, you will be aware that there are many important mathematical consequences, mathematical consequences of AC. And they include the theorem that every vector space has a basis. This is one of everybody's favorites. And um, this is proved using normally using Zorn's lemma. So you you have um you you consider some post set of sets of linearly independent elements and you order them in a natural way and um then you show that every chain has an upper bound and that a maximal element in that this post set post set in fact spans the space and therefore it's a set of linear linearly independent elements that spans the space and therefore it's a basis. So a nice application of Long's lemma, but it turns out this theorem is actually equivalent to the axiom of choice. So you can't prove the, I mean, you can use the axiom of choice to prove the theorem, but you can't use anything weaker than the axiom of choice because you can derive the axiom of choice um, back as a result. So it's equivalent to AC. Then there's Tikhonov's theorem in topology. Hands up if you've heard of Tikhonov's theorem. Not, not everywhere. That, that probably depends on whether you've done a general topology course or something. Tikhonov's theorem is a product of compact topological spaces in the product topology is, again, compact. And this is, again, equivalent to AC. Then there's in functional analysis, 
very important theorem, the Han Barnard theorem, about extending linear functionals defined on subspaces to the whole space, related things, several versions. Um, there are lots of theorems that derive from this as well. Um, and AC is very important here. But actually, this theorem, you can prove it from AC. Once again, it's proved using a Zorn's lemma like argument as one of the, nat the natural arguments. But actually, this is weaker than AC. So it's not, I don't know. So it's not equivalent to AC. But I'm not quite sure if probably someone is pinned down the logical statement that it's equivalent to, but I, I don't know about that. Um, something from algebra. Uh, Scrolls theorem. Hands up if you've heard of Kroll's theorem. Okay, so we're now getting to people who've done specialist algebra courses or something like that. But uh, anyway, Kroll's, the Kroll's theorem is that um, every ideal in a non-zero ring extends to a maximal ideal. So even if you haven't heard of Kroll's theorem, you might have used maximal ideals in rings and the fact that a, an ideal extends to a maximal ideal. And here we're going back to results that are equivalent to AC. And again, the natural proof of this uses Zorn's lemma. So Zorn's lemma is a mathematician's favorite version of AC because it's very natural lemma for establishing most of the consequences. So this is every ideal in a ring, in a non-zero ring, extends to a maximal ideal. Um, a similar concept occurs in the context of Boolean algebras. Um, so actually, Boolean algebras are special kinds of rings, idempotent rings, idempotent commutative rings. And um, Kroll's theorem in Boolean algebras can be formulated just in a, in a in, in an order theoretic version as well. There's, an, so there's an, also an order theoretic notion of ideal. And there's the theorem in a Boolean algebra, every ideal in a Boolean algebra extends to what is called a prime ideal. And this is called the Boolean prime ideal theorem or just the prime ideal theorem. But Boolean in brackets here, prime ideal theorem. And this is, so instead of saying not equivalent to AC, let's say weaker than AC. Weaker than AC. So this is, again, weaker than AC. But it's equivalent to a lot of useful things. So the Boolean prime ideal theorem um, is equivalent to some statement about the existence of um, non-principal ultrafilters. I don't remember the exact statement. Um, it's equivalent to the compactness theorem for logic. It's also equivalent to Tikhonov's theorem in the case of Hausdorff topological spaces. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a theorem that's weaker than AC, but um, still it, it has quite a bit of power in it. And so actually sometimes people consider this as an axiom as an alternative to to, to AC because they say, well, we don't need the full power of AC, but we can we can get away with this one. Still, this is um, it's still a very powerful principle. So it's not like it's, it's not quite as harmless as say countable choice and dependent choice, which are really about just very small amounts of choice. This is still applying choice to very large sets, just in a more limited way than the whole axiom of choice. Anyway, so this is a, a sort of selection of mathematical results that depend on and are in many cases equivalent to the axiom of choice. And uh, there's no reason to stop here apart from 
time and and actually if you ask me to come up with another one off the top of my head i don't think i'd be able to but um there, there are plenty of others other such theorems in, in mathematics i mean i would if i thought about it for a bit um so anyway lots of mathematics depends on ac even if it's not the full power of ac something weaker but um but still a powerful but still powerful choice principles and these are kind of results that mathematicians take for granted on a on a, on a daily basis and they're in, in many cases really fundamental to the area like Tikhonov's theorem is pretty fundamental in topology the Hahn barnack theorem is pretty fundamental in functional analysis vector spaces having a basis is pretty functional and is pretty fundamental in linear algebra so um you know if one wants to advocate for mathematics without AC, you have a lot of fights to win um, in order to persuade mathematicians to give up to give up these theorems. Um, but anyway, let's I'd, I'd like to consider life without AC as well. So we are going to do that a little bit on this course. So if one's trying to be neutral about what these results are giving. I mean, my opinion is they, they they make maths sort of tidier than it would be if you didn't if you didn't have these results. So for example, you could perfectly well live without every vector space having a basis, but every time you needed a basis, you would just need to stick an assumption in your theorem saying um, four vector spaces that have a basis, then we can do this, something like that. So um you know, maths is much tidier if you don't need to do that. So, um, so uh, you, you, we can argue about this at the end of the lecture or something, but anyway, my opinion is that AC makes mathematics tidier. I don't quite believe in concepts such as it is true in the Platonic universe of sets. Which, which some some mathematicians believe, um, but as you may know, AC also has unpleasant consequences, or I'm, I'm going to call them discomforting consequences. And everybody's favorite discomforting consequence of the axiom of choice is a result called the Barnard Tarski theorem. Which says you can take a solid sphere in three space, chop it up into five pieces. Reassemble those five pieces using only rigid transformations. So, so just translations and, in fact, just translations and rotations are enough. So, you're, you're really taking the pieces and just moving them around and reassembling them. And you can reassemble them in such a way that you form two spheres, the same, two solid spheres, the same size as the original. So, sounds like an absolute impossibility. Um, Sorry, I first heard about this when I was. I don't know, in my early teens, I think it was, but somehow it got, it got onto the morning news program on the British radio. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't, you know, there's this mathematician saying that, that there's this result, and it just sounded like such an impossibility. You know, um, uh, you know it was a, my mission in life to find out how this could possibly be true at, at that point. Um, and anyway, Anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting result, and it obviously depends crucially on the axiom of choice. Um, so I don't want to talk about that today, but in case people are interested in that, there's going to be, uh, as right at the end of the course, we're going to have one week without an exercise class. And instead of an exercise class that week, I'm going to give a, an optional extra lecture on the proof of the Barnard Tarski theorem. Um, so then we'll leave that till later in the course. But today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a baby case of the Barnard-Tarski theorem, an easy case, as much a simple result, which isn't quite as shocking. 
And this is, so this is, if you like it, the Farnark-Telsky theorem is kind of a, a result in a sort of geometry, because you're reassembling pieces of the, the sphere around in three space, but it's a kind of geometry that a geometer wouldn't recognize as geometry. So, um, so let's call it sort of set theoretic geometry. It's a, it's, a, it's a weird area. It has, has some mathematics, some actual reasonable mathematical pedigree because it's related to a topic known as amenable groups. So there is some actual, some, some mathematical content there that's of interest in the, in real math, to real mathematicians, so to speak. Um, but what we're going to look at the remainder of today is, is the a simple version of it called the Tallis theorem from around the, the turn of the 20th century, um, the start of the 20th century. And this is a, a very simple result in measure theory. And uh, many of you may have seen this before. So hands up if you've, if you've taken the, me the measure theory course. And presumably this theorem was, was, was this done? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this year, the course is only this year. So uh -huh. we're taking it right now. And uh -huh. I don't know if it's... If it's it's been mentioned yet, but I think yeah. it was. Sorry? I think it was. It, it has it has been mentioned. Yeah. Well anyway, we're going to do it again. So um from from, from, from our perspective. So anyway, I want to do this as a discomforting um consequence of the axiom of choice. Um so to do this, let us actually finally we haven't done it yet, but we're now going to assume the axiom of choice. And we're going to have the axiom of choice. For, for the rest of today's lecture, for the whole of next week's lecture, and then I can't live with the axiom of choice for more than a lecture in the third. So after that, we're going to then retract it and go back to uh, to the to the uh, world of mathematics without the axiom of choice. Um, I'm just really, just thinking of the number of things that I don't want to be recorded on video that uh, that I'm saying. But anyway, anyway, so henceforth assume. AC. And uh, the Tallis theorem it's, it addresses the question can we define a reasonable notion of measure on arbitrary subsets of the reals? Um, so, can we define? Right. A good measure function. Well, let's call it a length function because what we're trying to measure is the length of a subset, so how much of the line it takes up. A good length function, which we call lambda. Um, so the length, length function, we want to define it on an arbitrary subset of the reals. So the, the length of the unit interval will, of course, be one. Length of the reals as a whole will be infinite. A length is always, I mean, you could say if you go in the negative direction, a length will be negative, but then we need signed measures, those are a bit complicated. So and you need to have positive measures before you know what a signed measure is anyway. So we'll just deal with positive length. So we're going to assign a length function. So it will be a non negative real, but we can also assign infinity, the whole real line. The whole real line will be assigned a length of infinity. Um, so, for example, if we considered a, a set such as, um, let me so consider, and this is a set to which we would expect to be able to assign assign a length. Um, if we consider the set that contains the interval, the close interval from zero to a quarter, then we miss out the open interval from a quarter to a half, but then we put in the closed interval from a half to um, five eighths, I suppose, and uh, miss out from five eighths to three quarters, and then we go from three quarters to, I suppose, uh, 13 sixteenths. I hope that this is what's in my notes, I'm not thinking it through again. You can, and then the next one is um, from seven eighths to 
29 over 32, and so on. And um, each time we start, we go a quarter of the way towards the end. Is that right? Yeah. Each time we start, we go a quarter of the way to the way towards the end. We then leave a gap the same size as the as the as the block we've just taken up, and then we, and then and then we and then we start again. And we see that this should have a well known, and not well known, a well defined length, because this part is a quarter, this part is a, is an eighth in length, and this part is a sixteenth in length. This is a thirty second in length, and so on. And um, they're all disjoint, and therefore that the length of the whole thing, so the lambda of this set, of the above set, if we had a well-defined length function, we would expect that lambda of this set is uh, a half. Okay. So can we define a well-defined length function? And Vitalis' theorem says, no, we can't. We can't define such a function that whose domain is the whole of the power set of is of the real. So that is defined on every subset of the reals. So what properties would we expect of a well-defined length function? And it says there is no function that enjoys the properties we would expect such a well-defined length function to have. So if we tell this theorem, uh, is no function, the length function lambda from the power set of the reals to zero to the non-negative reals together with infinity, satisfying following properties that if we apply the length function to an open interval, the length of an open interval is what you expect. So we are assuming B is greater than A. I'm only greater than or equal to A, in fact. Um, if we've got any collection of subsets and reals that is disjoint, it's a pairwise disjoint. So it is, if it's a countable set of pairwise disjoint, disjoint subsets of R, then just as we were doing here with this countable set, the idea of length should be that if you have a disjoint collection, um, a countable collection, then the length of the union is the sum of the lengths of the components. And then the length of the union of I is the sum over the individual components, each of each X is, is one of the disjoint components, that's so a set of reals of lambda of X, so lambda. Okay. Um, and the third property, this property is called countable additivity. And there's a, a finite version where we say finite instead of them, it's called finite additivity. But obviously that follows from countable additivity. And lastly, for any for any subset, sorry, X is a subset of the reals, and uh, and real number, which we're going to consider as a displacement. If we trans, if we transpose the uh, the function X by D by distance D, we'd expect the length to be undetected. So, so the lamp, so if we apply the length function to the, the set x plus theta, where well this simply means the set of all elements in x with d added to each one. Um, so that's the same as the length of x. And that's called translation invariance.
I when I said transpose, I meant translate. Translate. I realized it sounded wrong at the time, but uh, I didn't stop to correct it. And that's enough. These three properties are enough to get that there is no such function because it follows from these properties. Many things follow, and you can prove these as an exercise. Now, if we have such a function, then for any such lambda, the, the following properties follow. So it follows that the length of the empty set is zero. It follows that the length of the singleton set is also zero. Um, it follows that the length of a closed interval is the same as the length of the open interval. It follows that the length of the whole real line is infinite. And it follows the monotonicity property follows. So if X is a subset of Y, then the length of X is less than equal to the length of Y. Okay. And um, I want to prove, prove the theorem. I don't want to spend very long on it because I want to then talk about what the... Um, what the take-home lessons from the theorem are at the end. That's kind of the main thing, thing I want to do at the end of the lecture. So let's, and uh, we've got 20 minutes, so it should be all right. Um, but well, I don't I maybe want to spend at most 10 minutes on, on the proof. Um, the proof is very nice. So just out of interest, how many people have seen this result before? With together with its proof. Okay, so few of you, but not certainly, but not everyone. Um, and the really nice bit of the proof is right at the beginning, and then the rest of it is you just need to sort out the you know, sort out the consequences of it. And the so we're going to use. So although we've assumed AC, but let me just emphasize that this is critically a consequence of the axiom of choice, that there is no way of, of measuring subsets of the reals, or all, all subsets of the reals, so that these three properties, all intuitively reasonable properties, all hold. Um, why not? Well, we're going to define an equivalence relation I, I use a double twiddles in the lecture notes, but for brevity on the board, I'm going to use a single the single twiddles. Um, so I, I use I use a sort of similar a different notation in the, in the notes. But anyway, so we're going to define a, an equivalence relation by um, by x is equivalent to y if and only if the difference between them. Is irrational, but if and only if they are a rational distance apart. So it's equivalence relation, it defines equivalence classes. So one equivalence class is the set of all rationals. Another equivalence class is the set of all real numbers that are whose difference to pi is rational. Um, another is the set of all real numbers whose distance to E is rational. I guess I guess it's probably known that those two are disjoint, but I'm not totally sure about that. It must be known. That, is it known whether pi plus E is rational or not? Or this. pi minus E. So anyway, one can get into tricky questions. Oh. I, I can I know lots of questions like this are not known, but I never remember which ones. I think, anyway, I think it's known that one of E plus pi or E times pi is irrational. 
Ah, was on one of yes, them. So. Yes, okay, cool. I didn't think of the sound. Uh, yes. Anyway, yes. never mind. Let's not get, get, but I mean, it's fascinating that a lot of things are not known in this direction. Um, so we have an equivalence relation. Um, actually, we're going to, because we've got an equivalence relation on the reals, it restricts to an equivalence relation on the open interval zero and one. So, so this gives, so this is an equivalence relation. And by the axiom of choice, every equivalence relation has a set of representatives. So a set of elements such that we have exactly one element from every equivalence class. I'm going to consider such a set of re representatives, but for this equivalence relation, just on the interval, the open interval from zero one. So let K be a set of representatives, representatives for equivalence classes, representatives for equivalence classes um, for the equivalence relation on the set of the open interval from zero to one. So it's obviously the equivalence relation cuts down to a, an equivalence relation of this interval. So at this point, this is where we used AC. So let's flag that to get the set of representatives. So for each real number, there's exactly one element in, sorry, for each real number in zero, one, there's exactly one element in K that's in its equivalence class. And actually that holds for the whole real line. So it holds that we have for every X in the real line, there exists a unique a unique um, Z in K such that Z is equivalent to X. Because every Z in the real line, just by subtracting a, a suitable or adding a suitable integer, well, you can always because integers can be negative, you can always subtract. So just by subtracting a suitable integer from it, we can all, ah, at least an integer plus or minus a half, because we, we're actually looking at the open interval here. Um, but uh, any, anyway, by uh, uh, subtracting a suitable rational from it, we can get it into, into the interval zero, one. And then, because we've got a representative of the equivalence classes on zero, one, there's a unique element of K that's equivalent to it. So this principle is going to be important. Yeah. Let's call this star, this property. Right, so. So now assume we have a lambda satisfying the properties in the, in the theorem, and we're going to prove that, and we're going to derive a contradiction. So suppose we have a lambda Suppose we have a lambda as in the theorem, and we derive a contradiction. Um, so the question is. What is the measure of the set? What what length are we assigning? Does our lambda function assign to the length k? Maybe it's zero. So suppose lambda k equals zero. And now I don't want to, the details don't take long, but I don't want to fuss around with the details. You can look in you can look in the notes, but the idea is if if k is zero, if the if the length of k is zero, then then we can exhibit the whole real line as a countable union 
as a countable disjoint union of translations of K. So, so translations means shifting by some real number distance. And then by the, the axiom of countable additivity and by translation invariant, by translation invariants, each of these translations has measure zero. By countable additivity, the whole real line therefore has measure zero, but that contradicts the fact that the real line has measure infinity. So this, um, so then, so then the measure of the real line Then, then we have zero is, is the measure of the real line because of the, it's a countable unit and translation invariance, but the measure of the real line we've already seen is, in, is infinity, and that's a contradiction. I'll do this hash for the contradiction. On the other hand, suppose that lambda k is, the measure of k is greater than zero, then we can exhibit a subset of, well, because the bounds here make things very slightly fiddly, but it's very easy to, for example, exhibit a subset of zero two as a countable disjoint union of translations of K. So then as a count of the infinite, and you can look in the notes for details, we can exhibit a subset of zero two, as a countable disjoint union of translations of K. And so let's call this subset A. So then, then the, the measure of, of A on the one hand, by monotonicity, it has to be less than equal to the measure of the interval, which is two. But on the, on the other hand, it's a countable disjoint union of, of um, translations of K, each of which has the same measure, which, the same positive measure. So we're adding countably many times the same positive number, which gives us infinity. And that's, of course, again, a contradiction. OK, so. The details in this, these parts, you can look in the notes or you can look in the textbook for them. I'm just giving you a flavor here because as I said, what I want to go, what I want to go to now is the, what we can learn from this. Um, because clearly it's important in mathematics. I mean, maybe not clearly, but it is important in mathematics to have, um, a notion of length for subsets of the real numbers, at least for some subsets of the real numbers, um, and more generally for subsets of Euclidean space, and in fact, more generally for subsets of arbitrary sets. And this is the basis of leisure theory. And the theorem tells us we can't have a notion of measure that was on the power set that would satisfy all the properties we want it to. So what can we do? Well, let's say, how can we deal with this? Well, there are actually four options. So we can't have a length function called the measure that is enjoys the property that it gives the right length to interval. We'll take that as granted. We'll take that for granted, rather, we'll take that as, as, as a necessity that it assigns the right length to intervals. But it's translation invariant, countably additive, and defined on all subsets. So we've got three properties there. We could weaken any one of them. So the so option one is drop translation invariance.
And in this case, it's probably consistent that there exists a measure on the power set of the reals that satisfy the other properties. Um, but that implies a large cardinal exists. So we haven't talked about large cardinals in, the, in this course. So the existence of a count of the additive lambda with the other properties of lambda um, relate, is related, uh, let's just say, is, well, we're going to come back to this later in the course, but is related to large cardinals. That's a bit weird. Large cardinals are, as the, as the name suggests, I mean, cardinals can get very large, but large cardinals are cardinals that are so large that you need a new axiom to, to assume they exist. So that's what happens if you drop translation invariance. We could weaken countable activity, we could keep translation invariance, but weaken countable additivity to finite additivity. Weaken countable additivity to finite. In this case, we can, we can prove that uh, such a length function exists. And that was done by Barnach. Who, and Barnach is, a, is an, amazing, an, an amazingly productive mathematician. Um, so we can improve that lambda exists. Um, but existent that, that the result does not generalize. So that's for, we were talking about the real line. So if we're looking at length. You might look at two dimensional space in which you're looking at area. Actually, Barnack also proved that a finitely additive translation inva invariant measure exists for in two dimensional in two dimensions, but the result does not generalize to r to the n for n greater than equal to three. So with limited scope for being able to deal with finitely additive translation invariant measures. And in any case, what's the point of doing this or this? when it's a fact of mathematical reality that to do anything useful with measures, you need to do with the measure of, 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 of the line. Translation invariance is very important. Um, yeah, it's an example of what's called a Haar measure. And the whole point of Haar measures is they're based on translation invariance. Um, and countable additivity is very, very fundamental in applications of measure theory, such as probability theory. So these two are kind of really. I think you said does not generalize them, but you didn't write them not. Oh yeah, yeah, that's very important. So important that it need, needs to be in a different color. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so then, so what's a more useful thing to do? A more useful thing is um, relax. So. So uh, how do I word it? I'm struggling for words and we're running out of time. And the, the clock on the back wall is, is already nearly at, nearly at five. So, um, so instead of working, instead of working with, so what we're going to relax is having the, the, the measure defined on the power set. So instead we work with a length function or a measure defined on, some other set where this is just a collection of suitably nice subsets of the reals called measurable subsets. And this is the whole basis of measure theory. So this is and this is a workable solution to um, you know one of one avoids not. You just don't define a measure on all subsets because the axiom of choice means there exist nasty subsets, so all non-measurable subsets, such as this subset K here, such as this subset K. That's an example of what's called a non-measurable set. 
avoid, don't worry about the existence of non-measurable sets. They exist, the axiom of choice says so, but anyway, let's just um, say we have a measure function on some sets that we'll call measurable, and that will work, and that works very nicely. So this is the solution of choice, if you have the axiom of choice. For most mathematicians, well, for all, all mathematicians are expected. But if you're a logician, then there's another very tantalizing option, which is what? Discard choice. Exactly. Drop AC. And then it's consistent that a, a fully fledged lambda exists. That lambda from PR to zero infinity exists. with all desirable properties. And um, I'm one of the few people in the world that really likes this option. Uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite keen on this. And I may, I may try to squeeze something in later in the course about it, but um, I'm not sure. We will have to see. We're, we're, because we missed the first week of semester, we're a bit pressed for, pressed for time. So, um, yeah, we'll see. But anyway, this is the solution of choice of mathematicians. So one can perfectly well deal with this unpleasant fact that there exist non-measurable sets by just saying, okay, well, let's only work with measurable sets. For me, it's kind of I find I, I find that there's you know essentially one one has one wants to have the axiom of choice for, say, linear algebra, so that you can state you can you can work with linear algebra and say every vector space has a basis, just without having to make the assumption that vector spaces have a basis. But then, when you get to measure theory, you have to start putting in assumptions that wouldn't have to be there otherwise. You have to say every measurable set. Whereas, so so for me, it's it's. It's not as clear cut as mathematicians normally see. That's kind of give and take. You, 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 we get a simplification in some ways, but we get a complication in another in other areas of mathematics. And maybe for some purposes, it would be useful to simplify other areas of mathematics at the expense of uh, potentially not worrying about sort of having to insert statements like vector spaces having bases and so on. Anyway, good, I've overrun, so sorry. Uh, that's everything for today. I'm going to stop the video. Um...